What are some of the most common sales mistakes I see and how can you avoid them? Great question. Welcome back to the sales doc. I am glad that you're here because these mistakes cost people a lot of money in lost deals. And today we're going to unveil them, show you what they are and tell you how to fix them so that you are closing more consistently. I'm Amy Walker, client acquisition specialist and the sales doc, and I am here to help you be able to close with confidence and gain the skills that you need to create consistent, predictable sales. honest for a minute here, most of us didn't grow up as kids saying, I really would love to be a salesperson when, when I grow up. We are in sales as entrepreneurs because we're passionate about our product, we're passionate about our service, or we're passionate about freedom and a lifestyle. And for many people, sales is that linchpin that if you can really unlock it, you can have anything that you want in business. But for a lot of us, because we didn't grow up dreaming of being a salesperson, this can be an area of our business that's maybe a little bit uncomfortable, maybe puts us outside of our comfort zone, or maybe makes us feel like we don't even wanna do it. I am here and excited to unlock that for you today and help you get really confident in sales. Normally in the sales doc videos, we're answering specific questions from viewers like you. Um, feel free to submit a question if you have one down below. But today what we're gonna do is actually cover something that I wish people would ask about more and it's what are the most common sales mistakes and how can I avoid them? So many deals are lost within this list. And if you are struggling to close right now, I promise as you watch the video, you will find the thing that you do that you didn't even know was wrong, but it's costing you a lot of money. Plus, I'll tell you how to fix it. The first common mistake that I see is bringing desperation energy into the sales call. If you are a business owner, you need sales in order to pay for your business expenses, pay your team members, and pay yourself. I get it. But if you are bringing a sense of desperation into the appointment that you are looking at it going, I need to close this deal, I need to close this deal, the people feel it and it doesn't feel good. It comes across as desperate, pushy, high pressure, manipulative. And so they're not having a positive sales experience buying from you and it's not because you're intentionally trying to make them feel that way you're coming in with desperation so what do we do about this this is where mindset work is so 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 critical mindset work is like a shower you cannot say oh yeah I took a shower once I went to a mindset seminar once I listened to a book once it's constant it's ongoing before you get on your sales call you need to do a check-in and be honest with yourself am I bringing desperation energy in because desperation energy repels whereas excitement and passion and purpose that's going to attract your clients and they're going to want to engage with you and have a positive experience interacting so before you get on a sales call, do a mindset check, and then reframe. If you need to do some app affirmations, if you need to do some meditations, if you need to listen to some like really empowering positive words from your favorite sales coach, do those things so that once you get on the phone or once you get into that meeting, everything is where it should be inside of this space right here. We've got a lot more tips coming, but if you feel like this is helpful for you, make sure that you like the video and then subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so you can get notified every time we release new content. All right, selling mistake number two is selling to the wrong unqualified lead. This can happen two ways. One is because you've attracted in a lot of different leads and some are qualified and some are not, and you're spending the same amount of energy trying to close unqualified leads as you are qualified leads. Or it can happen because your marketing is actually bringing in the wrong leads and you're getting people who are just not your ideal client. It is going to waste a lot of time and energy trying to sell to people who are not your dream client. They are not ones that can afford you. They don't value the work that you do. And it's just going to pull your energy down and make you feel like nobody can afford you. Nobody is interested, nobody wants this. When in reality, you're just having sales conversations with the wrong people. So what you do, if this is ringing true to you, what you do is you put some pre-qualifiers at the beginning of your sales conversations, and as soon as you realize, 
they're not your person. Stop trying to close them and simply move on to the next. You can end that call in a very friendly way and you just have to say something like, you know, based on what I'm hearing, I'm not actually sure that I'm the best fit for what you're looking for. It was really wonderful meeting you. And then you can direct them towards some resources that might be a better fit for them. Easy peasy. Now, if you really are truly bringing in all the wrong leads, this is a marketing issue and you're going to, it's not even a sales issue, right? You're going to need to actually go back to the drawing board with your marketing plan and figure out what is it that is attracting the wrong audience in. It's probably in your messaging. Mistake number three is selling without a script. Can we be totally transparent? We are humans. We feel different from a day-to-day -day basis. We feel different in the morning than we feel in the afternoon versus the evening. We are inconsistent beings. And so when we're not using a sales script, we tend to have really inconsistent sales experiences. It's up, it's down, it's all over the place. Depending on the person that we talk to, we might forget to put some things in or go too long in a different section. A good sales script is a framework for having a consistent sales experience and you absolutely need one. If you don't have one that you love or it's not working well for you, I'm gonna invite you to go grab my sales templates and scripts for free. They're actually inside of this book. It's called the I'm Not a Salesperson Sales Book, Sell Like a Natural Even If You're Not, and you can get a free digital copy by clicking the link below, or you can go to salesaremything.com and grab that copy. It's got all of the templates in there, plus a bunch of mindset training. A lot of these issues that we're talking about today actually are solved within this book, so make sure you grab it. The fourth common mistake is talking too much, talking more than the clients. When I give you information, your subconscious mind can choose to accept or reject that information. But when you give me information to your subconscious mind, that is truth that has been laid on the table. If you structure your sales conversation so you're asking really good questions, your potential clients will tell you literally everything that you need to know in order to close them. And once they've said it, they can't pull it back and disagree with it because it came from them. It feels like their own truth. When we're structuring our conversations, we need to pay attention to how much we're talking versus how much we're listening. I like to get my clients talking and then I like to listen a lot and ask a lot of questions to get them so that they are vocalizing a couple of really important things. Number one, I want them to claim what they actually want. Number two, I want them to have clarity on what are the problems that are keeping them from getting them what they want. And number three, I want them to see that gap and recognize what they don't know. Because when they have all of that clearly laid out in front of them, it's very easy for me to close a client because now all I have to do is come and show that I understand where they are and where they wanna be. I hear and understand the obstacles and show them that I have a path for how they're gonna get around the obstacles to get where they want. But if I'm just talking to them about benefits and features and how many hours of coaching they get and what our support looks like, it's not a productive sales conversation. So really restructure so that you are talking less and listening more. So we're about halfway through on our tips. Have you heard one yet that is speaking to you and helping you see where you're going wrong? If not, stick with me because I've got four more common selling mistakes coming your way plus what to do about them. Five is kind of a, a spinoff of number four, but it's over informing and it's a little bit different. When you're just talking too much, you could be talking about anything. Over informing is specifically when you get to the point where you're promoting and presenting your solution. When you give too much information, it makes the person feel confused and overwhelmed. And when they feel confused or they feel overwhelmed, they simply say no. Not because they don't like you, not because they don't kind of like your product, but because emotionally they don't feel like they're ready to take on another thing. So we want to present our product, our service in the simplest way possible. People want simple solutions to complex problems. Write that down. We all want simple solutions to complex problems. The easiest way that we can get to our end goal is the way that we want. So when you're going through all of the science or the details or the data to somebody who doesn't want that, that's gonna be totally irrelevant and it's gonna create confusion 
and overwhelm. However, you may have some buyers who are like, I want all the details, I want all the facts, I want the science, I want the data, I want it all. They're going to require that. So the easiest way to tell if you're over informing is to simply ask them what they would feel like they need to know in order to make a good decision if this is the right thing for them or not. And then you can customize the information that you give to fit their specific needs. I don't tell every single person every single fact because it would be too much. But for somebody who requires a lot of information, go ahead and give it to them. Sales mistake number six is that the first commitment you've asked for from them is the commitment to buy. That's not the first commitment they should be making. We wanna give them micro commitments that they can make along the way. Things like when we're in the discovery phase, we can ask questions like, okay, and how committed are you to doing something different about this? Or when we're going over the solution, um, we can ask them, now, are you committed to making these changes? Micro commitments along the way will make it so that by the time they get to hearing our offer, it's not about asking, are you committed to buying my stuff? It's about, are you committed to solving your problems? Are you committed to getting the thing that you tell me that you wanna get? Are you committed to your goal? And then if you are truly committed, you are a much stronger prospect for me to be able to close, right? So we want them to be highly committed to themselves and to what they want. And then we are simply positioning ourselves as a really great tool or resource to help them get there. Again, if you get the sales book and you go through my scripting templates, it has this languaging worked in so you can borrow, AKA copy my verbiage that I use in getting those commitments. The seventh common sales mistake is giving up when the sales objections come. This is when they say things like, wow, Amy, I'd really love to work with you, but it's just not in my budget. And you go, okay, well, thank you so much, you know, for talking today. And if you change your mind, just let me know. And it's this wimpy escape where you didn't know what to say, so you just gave up. We cannot do this. My friends, we have got to learn to overcome sales objections. Again, the sales objection scripts are in the book. And so you can go through and it will walk you through this process. But we really need to get confident in understanding that their sales objections have nothing to do with us. They have nothing to do with our product. They have nothing to do with our pricing. The sales objections that they tell you are the sales objections they tell over and over and over again. It is simply calling out what are the obstacles in their life that keep them from having the things that they want. If they tell you that they can't afford your product or service, guess what? They say that for other things too. It is not just you. So you get to learn to be really efficient at overcoming those sales objections. And uh, we have several videos that are training on that. I'll point you in the direction of one that will walk you through the four step process of how to overcome any sales objection. So I'll put that at the end of the video here. Okay, last one, this one kills me. It's slow follow-up. This one kills me, especially because I've had it on my own team where I'm like, you're so good at getting them interested and then you just lose them because you're slow in the follow-up. I am not the type of closer that requires you to say yes right now. I think that's actually kind of high pressure and it's a little bit manipulative. Um, there are certain people who can make a decision on the spot and I facilitate them making a quick decision, but there are others that need to process. And if I ask them for the quick decision, the answer will be no, simply because they don't wanna make it or they'll say it and then they'll be resentful that they were asked to make a quick decision. So I like to meet the person where they're at. Fast paced people, we're gonna to try to get the deal done that day. People who are slower paced, they're more detail oriented and they need a minute, I'm gonna give them a minute. But guys, I'm not gonna give them an hour. <laughs> so if they need a minute, I'm gonna give them a minute, but I'm not gonna give them two weeks, right? So what this looks like is asking for a quick follow-up. If somebody says to me, Amy, I think this is looking really good. I just kind of need to think about it. I need to get my ducks in a row. I'll say, awesome, let's do this. Why don't you really think about it tonight? Um, come up with any questions that you have and then let's jump on tomorrow. I can answer any questions and if you're feeling good about it, we can go ahead and move forward. That quick follow-up allows them to be able to go and go deep into what they need to look at and then we can come out and we can talk while they're still excited. They haven't had a lot of time for doubt to creep in and they still remember why they're motivated motivated to want to do this. 
If we have that conversation a week later, they have a lot more time for doubt, they've lost a lot of their enthusiasm, and they've probably also spoken with some naysayers who have uh, tried to tell them all the horror stories for why this won't work for them. So we want to shorten the follow-up. Now, if that's not a lot enough time for them, they'll tell you. If they're like, actually, I have something going on tonight, I'm not really gonna even be able to look at it until tomorrow, could we talk the next day? Fine, no big deal. I always want my follow-up to be on date. I know a deal is not progressing when we're not scheduled to talk again or they don't show up for the time when we're scheduled to talk. As long as we're on date and we're closely communicating and we're shortening the time in between those conversations, then a deal is progressing towards closing and I'm good with that. So now you've got my most common sales mistakes and how to avoid them. The next video that I do want you to go watch is how to overcome sales objections because this is the skill that you need to master. Thank you so much for being here and I look forward to diagnosing your sales woes anytime you need some sales support.